clearly not the, the design, but everybody lost their shit and like, it's not, it's a quad quad draw, it's this, it's that, it's the other, and I was like, well, I can't see another, another uh, round pip, so it's going to have 352 of the bus, it's really strange, you know, I did 384 this time around, and, you know, but then, I'm not going to talk to that, number one, it's 24 gigabytes of RAM, prepare to pay for it, and those of you who are like, oh, it's going to be, no, you're going to pay for it, and that's, that's, Ultimately, what I what I feel how I feel about twenty four gigabytes RAM, it's going uh, to be expensive. Yeah. That's it's it's GDDR six X by the way. That thing exists. GDDR six X exists. I was really skeptical on GDDR six X. We haven't heard anything about it. We didn't know where it was. Where, where it was what's happening? We should have seen something about it. We should have heard about it. Should have been true. Like you know, we should have had the standards done and We didn't see anything to do with it. So I was like, there is no GDDR six X. Apparently it's more expensive than GDDR6 standard stuff. Of course it is, it's faster, so it's going to be more expensive. And then they're up with 24 gigabytes of RAM. I don't know, but there was an earlier rumor where they were like, the, the higher end stuff had lower speed memory more than So for the things, look, long story short, these things are going to be fast. They're going to be like 4 to 50 percent faster than the previous generation stuff. They're adding, the, like, it's the more shaders, right? You get more shaders, you get better RT performance, all that kind of stuff. You get increased clock speeds. The clock speeds are up on these. They're around 1700 megahertz now, hardly according to row game. So 1700 megahertz is 200 megahertz faster than, than a 2080 Ti. So yeah, everybody's like, oh, but it's not fast enough. It's bloody fast. It's faster than it was before, right? Yeah, the clock speed increase. Yay. Mm. We should all be excited for that. Not fucking, oh, it's not as fast as I thought it was. Like, this is not magic. There's not wizardry. It's not, it's, it's, it's science and stuff. And shit. And the, the reality of it is, when you're building a GPU of this substantial size, it's really hard to get clock speeds up. So if they've got clock speeds up, that's great. Then Jim from the RTV did a video where he talked about these GPUs possibly being on Samsung 5mm. Jim, I love you, you know what I mean, right? You know what I believe in you. Do not believe that you can still have Samsung 5mm. I would find the same I genuinely don't. Could be, I'd probably go with this gym. I have to use something, but that's not happening. I'm sorry. I genuinely, I just don't see it happening. I don't see it, it being able to heal. If they have a problem with the same amount of heal, then what's the story with this one? It's not even replicating. It's, it's a big fucking die. You know, we've already seen leaks of how big the die is, and whether it's a mixture of these leaks are good or not. So when you see stuff like that, you know, you kind of start going, ooh, that's kind of. Yeah, maybe, maybe, like, that's the dice like, 600 something millimeter squared, and that, it's going to be smaller if it's on 7 millimeter, that's the reality, but you can do the mass before it's on 550 millimeter squared, so 600 something millimeter squared is too big, um, you know, uh, Jim was talking about how, you know, he can make the quadros really efficient, but he has made the quadros really efficient, I know he believes that guy, but we're every rumor in the that would point to these things would be powerful, so everything, in it is power is drawing a lot of power and everything about the cooler design that we've seen from the founders edition says to me that it's a card that's going to be cooled very well. Like it's four gigantic things with a bit of a copy in it so we need to be ready to store the airflow and then more air fits on the surface area when you dissipate the heat. Everything says that you need power connectors. It's probably on it, it sounds like eight nanometer. You know that? Like the TDP go up, wouldn't it? But then the dark spaces and the transistors are on the shaders that would be there. All it says that these cards are going to draw a lot of power. And then the clock speeds are going to come down. And when you look at how Pascal and the clock speeds, the biggest one like the clock speeds, the BKR, the clock speeds, 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 so that's how and that's how they were so powerful. So when you look at the, the 1080 versus uh, the 980 Ti, 1080 and 2500 shaders or something like that, compared to the, the, the uh, 980 Ti, which is the 2800 shaders, right? So you look at that comparison, you know, between that shaders versus 2800 shaders, the 1080s went so much better, you know, I think it's, 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 it's
Too much smoke around the Sat 8 nanometer, and there's just too much rumor around it. There's too much, you know, talk of it being 8 nanometer, just, just too much of that. So I just believe that it's going to be an 8 nanometer. I can't shake it. It's already June, but I just can't shake it. It's going to be an 8 nanometer. We shall see, though, we don't have to wait very long. It's the 15th of the month. In 15, 16 days, we're going to hear about it. We're going to know. Just over two months, we're going to know everything. And that's exciting. It should be all exciting when we have this card. Believe me when I say this, and I'm trying to prepare you for this. And I won't do Nvidia any favors in terms of what I say about these cards if they're hitting pricing that's been floating around the internet. Nobody knows what price these are. Nvidia decided pricing at the last minute to stop it from moving out. Every company does. The 24 gigabyte RAM thing is easily changed with just the clip of a finger. You can just take off the Two gigahertz, and we don't really go over two gigahertz. Who that's scary? Not saying that they'll lose, but it tells you something intrinsically. It tells you something. It tells you that they're scared the AD will lose. I think that's what it is. I think they're scared the AD will lose. So that's why they got rid of GA103. There was a GA103. That's why there was going to be GA103. Because they moved to the, Usually, originally, NVIDIA used to put their, their AD class card on a 104. Well, originally, it was a 104. 104. And then. They started this weird with this 103 die, and then the 103 die was pretty canceled. And now it's on the 102 die. So that's NVIDIA taking the NVIDIA series, I think. They're just saying, fuck it, we're shooting for the fucking stars on this launch. We're going as hard and as fast as we can. TDP to be damned, power efficiency be damned, everything just be out the window, go balls to the wall as fast as we can go, make these cards go absolutely as fast as they can go. By the way, Jim. I don't, I don't take your point on, um, I think, turning on the 7 nanometer in the I don't think that would be the case. I don't think that would be the case. But I do agree that it would be a much faster card. I do agree with that. However, however, I just think that, fundamentally, these graphics cards, it's just in video going, yeah, you can play down there with plebs and 500 quid consoles. You can do that. Go away. You have, you have your fun. In my weird big boy, 7,500 quid grounds. But it's the fastest thing in the game. It's, it's like this, this is going to be twice as fast as, as the, those, those boys down there. I mean, we would be talking about something that's 50% faster than 2080. Like, so like 70 or 80% faster than 2080. And, you know, the consoles are going to be. I'd say the Xbox will touch the 2080 Ti in terms of performance, and I'd say the PlayStation will be in and around the 2080 in terms of performance. So 
that's continuous life. That's where you want to play. But we're playing over here. We're the main ones. We're playing over here. Now, yeah, but you're being boy pass on a pony pony. And I don't see, like, if people who think that's a ridiculous for a 1500 point graphics card, I don't think it's stupid. I think it makes no sense. However, there are people out here that are in this world who pay $1,000 for a pony pony. Right? You pay $700. themselves, no car to compete. So they'll be forced to market and charge whatever they want. And guess what? A big nav is faster, they'll, they'll take all those niche sales and then they'll just drop the price. That's what they'll do. Uh, you know, the video will drop the price. That's what they'll do. So anyway, look, once again, like it. If you want to help me out with this demonetization, uh, yeah, if you want to help me out with the, with the like if you like to just like it, just like, just like, just like, just like skeptics, I don't know what they're wrong. Also, if you want to help me out go off to my Patreon, you can go off to my PayPal, you can, if you want to, there's, there's no obligation, but the only obligation I ask for. And yeah, um, if you want to do, uh, if you don't want to do either of those, but you still want to help me, so I don't want to reach you. Other than that, thank you everyone. 
recording. Play, 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 play. Hey guys, Chris here with the Good Old Gamer. So today we're going to talk about next generation hardware. We're talking Xbox Series X, I was going to say Xbox One X, PS5, RDNA 2 from AMD, and the upcoming Ampere GPUs from NVIDIA. As many of you know, NVIDIA has already announced their showcase for Ampere is going to be September 1st, so that's just over two weeks from today, so we don't have very long to get into this. Now, there's one thing that really kind of hit me here the other day. I was watching Digital Foundry's video right here, and in that Digital Foundry Direct, they mentioned something that really struck me. Ever since early this year, I've been talking about this generation of consoles. Me, personally, I thought that they were going to be between $399 and $499, and I explained why. And honestly, at this point in time, I think next generation technology, the price is going to go much higher than we were all anticipating. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about here today. So if you haven't been on the channel before, please hit that like button, please subscribe, please share. That really does help me out. So if you haven't subscribed, please hit that button, hit that little notification bell. That really helps me out. Sharing the video is the best thing you can do to help get my content out there. So this way we can do cooler things. All right, so moving on to the information. If you guys haven't noticed, the world is really crazy right now. This is the reason why I haven't been doing a lot of videos, kind of taking care of some stuff. So what's happening out there that I think might relate and actually affect the new technology that's coming out? And that would be the skyrocketing price of gold. If you guys haven't heard, just a couple of days ago, I think it was, maybe it was last week, not very long ago, gold hit a record high of over $2,000 per ounce. Now, I know this is supposed to be a tech channel, but we talk a lot about money and value, and you have to understand these things to understand what's coming in the tech field. And the reason why prices are gonna be going up isn't because like manufacturing technology or you know limited fab space or a lot of the stuff that we typically relate to prices of tech going up, larger dies, things like that, this time around it's going to be due to the currency weakening, especially here in the United States. It's where I live, so that's what I'm relating to. Some of you guys out there in other countries, your currency is actually going up because the dollar is weakening. Actually, I went ahead and checked it out. If you look at this little graph right here, the U.S. dollar has taken a major nosedive as gold is going up. That's kind of how it goes. Gold spikes, the dollar plummets. It's just the way it works. So how does this relate to all this cool tech that'll be coming out here imminently? Well, this is a big deal because Microsoft and Sony have not priced the next-gen consoles yet. And this is one of the reasons why, because obviously with all of the COVID stuff going on, nobody really knew what was gonna happen with the economy, so they didn't wanna shoot themselves in the foot. Let's think of it this way. Let's say Microsoft did come out, and let's say they put the Series X at 399. They were trying to be super aggressive, wanted to undercut Sony. They were pretty sure Sony was gonna be above that. Now, the dollar has dropped, well, when it was at its worst, it has recovered a little bit, but it dropped about 10% in like three days or something. It was crazy, which means they would be charging $399, but just a few days earlier, that $399 would only be worth about $350, $360. So they would be losing out even more, even if they wanted to lose $50 or $100 per machine. Now they're losing $150 or $100 per machine, whatever it would be. They're losing 40 to $50 more. That's a lot, that's a big deal. And let's say Sony also tried the same thing, wanted to be hyper aggressive and was in the same boat. Microsoft is a mega company. They got billions and billions and billions of dollars. They can bleed, they, they can bleed, let's put it that way. They can afford to lose that. But a company like Sony can't. You know, a miscalculation of that magnitude might actually bankrupt the company. If they sold a ton of PS5s, that could actually put them down if they were an extra $50 per unit in the red. So this is one of the reasons why the $399 price point, I don't think that that's gonna be likely anymore. I believe both Sony and Microsoft are gonna look at this situation and go, 
really want to get these things into people's hands, we want them to be as cheap as possible. Those companies are probably willing to make at, you know, very little money or take a loss. I believe Microsoft is going to take a bigger loss because Sony's in a stronger position. I don't think that they'll be as likely to accept losing money because they have the brand recognition right now. But Microsoft, I can see, with their big bank accounts, I think that they could do it. But once again, they're gonna look at this situation and go, over like 30 days or something, 10% of the value of the dollar drop. What's gonna happen in the next 30 days? They have to anticipate that it's actually gonna get worse than that, especially with the upcoming US election. I don't know if you guys follow any of that. I'm not gonna go into the politics, but both sides are basically saying they're not going to believe what the results are. So in November, things are gonna get really, really crazy here in the United States, and it will have an impact on the economy. And Microsoft and Sony aren't stupid. They have people that follow this stuff. So they're gonna be looking at that situation and go, hmm, unrest in the United States, what's gonna happen? Gold's gonna go up. That's what happens when there's uncertainty and unrest. When that happens, the value of the dollar goes down even further. So my guess is, both Sony and Microsoft are likely going to go with the higher end of their spectrum. So I think at the very minimum, we're going to see these consoles, the Series X anyway, and the PS5 with the DVD drive or Blu-ray drive. So the better one, that one will probably be at least, I think the bare minimum nowadays is probably going to be $4.99, but I'm betting both companies are looking at $5.99 at this particular point in time. And that was something that they talked about on that DF Direct. Um, they were talking about thinking that the price might be much, much higher than people are anticipating. And this is likely the reason why Microsoft is coming out with the Xbox Series S, which a lot of rumors were saying that that might be $199. I'm pretty positive that that's out the window at this particular point in time. Uh, I always thought $249 would make sense for such a machine. I think that's cheap enough that most people would have been okay with it, 150 less, even if it was 399 for the Series X. But uh, regardless, I'm thinking that's more likely going to be around the 299 mark, with 599 or at best 499 for the Xbox Series X. And the PS5 will probably be 499 and then 50. I doubt the Blu-ray drive is really going to cut off about 50 dollars or any more than that. The only reason why I could see Sony wanting to go with the discless version is because then you're locked into their ecosystem. The only way you could buy games is by digital download, and you can't get them anywhere else but from Sony. So I think that they were originally planning on taking a little bit more of a hit, maybe a $100 hit. So if they wanted the one with the drive at $4.99, then sell the one without the drive at $3.99. I think that was the original plan. But nowadays, like I said, with things being so chaotic, it seems more likely that Sony would just be like, okay, well, it costs 50 bucks for the drive, just not $50 off. So I don't think that that's going to be significantly cheaper than the version with the drive. We'll have to wait and see, but those are just my thoughts on the next-gen consoles. Now, this same logic will also factor in with the upcoming Ampere and RDNA 2 GPUs from AMD. Both companies, once again, they're looking at the exact same data, the same data that I just showed you, going, all right, well, last generation for NVIDIA, for example, their flagship graphics card was $9.99, which it never was, with a founder's price of $11.99. Well, like I just said, the market basically just bumped $10, so that $500 in your pocket is now only worth $450, well, in terms of buying power. So they're going to be going, all right, we need to price these things to where they don't lose out because they can drop the price. That's fine. Let's say the economy recovers and everything blows over and let's say the elections go smooth and I'm completely wrong and everybody else is completely wrong on this. Doesn't seem likely, but hey, it could happen. If that does happen, Nvidia, AMD, whoever, Microsoft, Sony, they can lower prices, but none of these companies can raise prices. Imagine if uh, NVIDIA comes out with the 3080 Ti at $999 with a $1,200 founder, founder's price, just like last time. It's not going to be any cheaper. Anybody think it's going to be cheaper, you're out to lunch. It's not going to happen. But 
but let's say they came out with that, and then let's say the dollar tanks another 20%. Okay, that means when you bought a Turing a few years ago, they were making way more money. That $1,200 is not worth the same. It's only worth maybe a thousand or $950 at that point. So Nvidia is not going to want to do that. So I would assume that they're going to look at this and go, "What's probably the worst case scenario over the next probably six months?" And my guess is they're probably going to be looking at $1,499 or even $1,999. Today I was watching Paul from Not an Apple Fan. He did a video where he believes uh, there's rumors going on that the 3080 Ti will have 24 gigabytes of RAM. I always thought that there would be a 24 gig version, or at least maybe like a Titan something will probably have that. Um, if that's the case, maybe that's what they're thinking. They're like, all right, this will cost us $200 more to build, but we can probably charge an extra five, six, seven hundred dollars. It can almost make it feel like it's worth that extra money because you're getting something that we didn't have last generation. So large RAM boots. So they could easily be like, oh, it's two thousand dollars, but you get twenty-four gigs of RAM. It only costs them an extra two hundred dollars right now, but that gives them that little bit of extra protection. Now let's say people can't afford it. You know, the economy is rough right now. A lot of people are out of work or people are working from home, limited, you know, don't get overtime as much. People are hurting. Now, there's still a lot of people out there with a lot of money. And most people that spend $1,200 on a video card can afford $2,000. That's kind of the rationale that I believe that they're probably thinking in their head. And in these times, like I said, a lot of people are hurting, but there's also a lot of people making a lot of money. There's a lot of money to be made in the market right now because there's so much turmoil. Chaos, it's so much easier to make money. It's also so much easier to lose money. It's kind of that double-edged sword. You know, under even times, it's harder to make money, but it's also harder to lose money. We can go into that at a different time, but regardless, typically people right now that are doing well beforehand are likely also still doing well. Highly skilled jobs are still needed. You know, nurses, doctors, we know with the whole COVID thing, a lot of them, are in high demand right now. Although there are a lot of reports of like nurses and stuff getting laid off, but doctors especially, they're in high demand. And highly skilled labor, that's always in high demand. I think there's uh, 1 million open jobs for AI programming out there. So if you need a job, learn how to program AI. That's, that's the way to go right now. A ton of high paying jobs, and they need people and they'll take you. You could have the COVID, you could be missing an eye, they don't care. They need you, and that's really a field to get into. So these people are still doing well, and these are the people that are going to spend $2,000 on a graphics card. And uh, it, it's just one of those situations where it makes sense. It's not really them price gouging. It's the fact that the dollar is going in the toilet, and what else are they going to do? They're not going to sell you something for less money. You know, is it theoretically possible that the U.S. currency cuts in half, 50% loss off of where it was just a couple of months ago. It's not outside the realm of possibility with everything going on. Federal Reserve from the first stimulus, $6 trillion printed. That dilutes everybody's savings. It's crazy. And then they're passing this other stimulus. Uh, Trump just signed an executive order. That's more money that we don't have, which means they're just going to print it. So that means that money is just taking value from all the current money out there and sucking it in. You, you can't just make up money. If you don't understand how money works, well, we can do a video on that. Let me know in the video description below. So I just wanted to make this video and let you guys know with everything that's going on in the world right now, do not expect cheap things right now. And it's not really the company's fault. Uh, not at this point in time. It's not just pure price gouge for the sake of price gouging. This is clearly outside their control. The only people that are in control of the money is the Federal Reserve Bank here in the United States. And guess what? They're a private company and they're doing what's best for them. A lot of people think that it's part of the government. It's not. So it's just a group of people making, printing money for themselves and lending it to the U.S. to pay for other stuff. It's a bad time, so do not expect prices to be going down. Expect them to go up pretty harsh. So if there's anything out there right now that you're looking to buy, you're like on the fence, don't wait. 
uh, between all the trade stuff going on with China, we could even add that in there. Obviously, that's escalating. We're basically in a Cold War with China at this point. Who saw this coming? That's crazy. It started off as a little trade war. Now it's now it's blown up. And uh, so that means it's going to be harder to get stuff shipped over. So that's another thing added on top. There's a lot of things going on out there. So if there's anything out there that you're thinking about getting, do not wait. Pick it up as soon as you possibly can. Because like I said, inflation could kick up real hard. And I think these companies are going to preempt that by raising prices. So I would expect 80 Ti or 3090, whatever they're going to call it. I'm going to say probably around two grand. I'm going to say the 80 class, probably around 1200, 70 class, around 700, and then it's just going to go down from there. Um, next gen consoles, I'm thinking 599, probably going to happen, but hopefully 499. It really just depends on how much of a haircut both Microsoft and Sony are willing to take. And the haircut that they were willing to take before, I'm betting they're still going to do that, you know, 50 to to $100 per unit. But like I said, the value of the dollar going down, this means that 50 or 100 now has to scale up because, you know, what cost them to build, you know, 300, 400 dollars a couple months ago, now that's costing them 500 dollars to build. So that's just the case. That's just the way it is, you know, getting stuff over. Everything's going to be great, guys. Well, there's also other really big news that has happened over the past few weeks. I'm going to do that in the next video. I think NVIDIA is actually in the position to take over the entire computing landscape. I think they're going to do something that Tom from Moore's Law is dead and I actually suggested for them to do as a company. Um, but between their rise and Intel falling, there is an opportunity for NVIDIA to take over everything. Consoles, phones, PC, server, everything, and that's pretty crazy, and I'll talk about that in the next video, but alrighty guys, that's all I have for you guys here today, if you like the video, please hit that like button, please subscribe, once again, please share, that really does help me out, that's all I have for today, I will catch you guys in the next video. new report exclusively done for the Evening Standard. You will find their article linked in the description below this video. Now, according to their report, NVIDIA is now entering final talks for acquiring ARM, and we will see a potential deal emerging before the end of the current summer season if their information is correct. And further to their information, that the CEO of SoftBank, Masayoshi Sun, is apparently demanding a price of £40 billion pounds or $52 billion dollars for ARM. Now obviously there can be a million and one things that go wrong or get in the way of NVIDIA or any of the other companies being there purchasing ARM, NVIDIA especially, because obviously there are several existing com com customers, companies I should say, sorry, that already use ARM technology and will probably want assurances that they will still get access to ARM's tech or maybe try to block the acquisition because don't forget ARM is a million and one thing, some of which are competing with NVIDIA's technology. So obviously those existing customers have enough to want to know, okay, why you can block this over here basically. And obviously we may see it roadblocks come from other way uh, other places like that in the government because one of the things that happened in the 2016 deal with SoftBank was that Provided a commitment to keep it to the which is in the UK. Now, 
obviously we'll have to wait and see how true this ends up being, but safe to say, if NVIDIA did indeed end up requiring ARM, it would be a huge move for the industry and it would have a ripple effect, given how pervasive ARM's technology actually is. But we're going to move on to our next topic now, which is actually regarding the prices for memory and SSDs. So there was a report on digitimes.com about the low prices for memory and SSDs, thanks to some comments made by the CEO of Epesa, and they said to Digitimes that they expect both DRAM and NAND, so SSD and flash storage prices, to remain low, at least through the first half of 2021. And the article reads, quotes, the DRAM and then flash markets are expected to see oversupply last into the first half 2021, but in some other markets, strong demand has fueled sales growth for many companies, such as notebook ODMs, whose production is bad in its support state and no needs, but no back ODM production have been undermined by components uh, shortages. Tight capacity at 8-inch wafer fabs has been blamed for shortages for some IEC parts needed for notebook production, DRAM and NAND flash and oversupply. The DRAM and NAND flash markets will be oversupplied to the first half of 2021. And again, that is according to the CEO of Pacer Technology, who are a memory model maker for those who are familiar. So obviously we'll have to wait and see how true this is, but obviously we have seen low prices for memory and SSDs for quite some time now. But I do feel that some relief was definitely needed. I'm sure you guys don't need to be reminded of a little while ago when the prices for RAM and memory and general SSDs, whatever, were just insane. But the prices for RAM especially were just kind of crazy. So it was nice to get a little bit of relief in that regard. We may see a price hike in, in the future. So let's move on to a couple of PlayStation pieces of news, the first of which is regarding PlayStation VR. So this time around we have the folks over at UploadVR.com to thank for this particular uh, piece of news that they have discovered a job listing from Sony Corp in Japan which confirms that the company is working on some sort of quote next generation of VR head mounted display. Now the listing which is Google Translate is obviously do keep that in mind says quote we are developing a next generation of VR head mounted display and it further states that they're looking for a team of around 50 people that will be quote in charge of mechanical design, the lens barrel supports the optical system, small and lightweight housing, heat radiation design, development of jig for optical system evaluation, etc. Now there is one thing to keep in mind with this, it's not necessarily a confirmation of PlayStation VR 2. Because let's let's take a deeper look at the job listing. It is for Sony Corporation rather than Sony Interactive Entertainment, which was the part that houses the PlayStation. And also the job does sorry, the job listing should I say it does state that they are looking to develop a mechanism for a headset quote within a few to five years from now. Now again this is Google translated and it's not super clear. So obviously everything should take a deal with the salt TM as always until it comes from the mouse from the company. There's a couple of potentialities here. It could be a PlayStation VR 2, or it could be the generation beyond that, or it could even be a standalone headset for the PC market. Of course, there's also the potential that it could be for the mobile market as well, something similar to say the Samsung headset, but I would say that's least, so it's less likely, but obviously I'm just speculating. I'm not basing that off any inside information. I am just making an educated guess at best. Personally, I think it's fairly likely that we will see some sort of VR headset for the PlayStation 5. The PS uh, VR headset for the PS4 did insanely well in terms of raw sales, at least in comparison to the other virtual reality headsets on the market. As of an article written on January the 6th of 2020, there were 5 million PlayStation VR units sold. So I think Sony would be eager to perhaps keep that ball rolling, get the costs down, get more games on there and that sort of thing. Because as I've said a million and one times, the main barriers to entry for VR is the very high cost of the headset. Plus if it's for PC, you've got to have the hardware to back it up. And obviously there's just not that many flagship killer games to actually convince someone to part with like say three, four hundred pounds or whatever for PSVR 2 or what have you when they've already shelled out for the console itself. But that's not the only PlayStation news I have for you today. There's also speculation that we will see 
a new state of play soon. I guess soon TM. And this is thanks to a tweet from Iron Man PS5. And he says, quote, remember this message, see you Thursday, hashtag start week, hashtag PS5, hashtag state of play, and then hashtag Iron Man state of play. So obviously the information here is basically non-existent, but he is hinting that we will be seeing some sort of state of play this Thursday. So that would be Thursday the 20th of August, as of the time of recording. Hopefully it will be a PS5 focused event, maybe it'll even be the long rumoured teardown, which of course we were the first to report, at least according to our sources, we'll be seeing a teardown later on this month. But we're going to leave Sony in our dust for now and move on to the Xbox Series X. So what we have is a couple of leaks regarding a potential price tag for the console. Now, the first one was from the creator Alana Pierce, and apparently someone sent her a photo from a retail store PC which showed an Xbox Series X price of $599 US. And then to seemingly kind of sort of confirm this, there was another leak alongside this thanks to a Halo Infinite and Monster Energy Drink promotion. Now the promo doesn't even begin until September the 1st, but details of it have already found their way onto the internet. And the promo basically is them giving away some prizes, which include a copy of Halo and the Xbox Series X console. Now, Monster have said for their promo that the total AI, ARV excuse me, of the prize pool is almost $120,000, to be specific. Now, according to the calculations of comicbook.com, we will see a price via their quick maths of $599 US. Now, let's talk about what I think about this $599 price for the Xbox Series X. Now, to be honest, I'm skeptical of this price. It could very well be a placeholder. All reports are indicating that Microsoft are trying their hardest to undercut Sony, and I just don't think the price is actually set in stone yet. Prices are set pretty much last minute. The PS4 was the case. Sony set the price really late, and apparently the RTX 20 series of prices for that series of cards were decided pretty much on the day of the show. Now, with all that said, it's very, very possible that these are true and that this is just the lowest that Microsoft could go given the specs of the machine, or it could be the upper limit of what they're considering. Maybe $600 is the most expensive that they feel they can go in terms of whether or not they want to buy it, all that sort of stuff. But if it is true, it obviously raises several interesting questions, the first of which is how will Sony compete with this? Will we see them deliberately undercut this price just to well, undercut that price? And it also makes you wonder what the price for block card or the Xbox Series S is actually going to be. Perhaps we'll see that come in around 500 bucks. Obviously, I'm just speculating. So a bit of a fun bonus topic for you guys. This is Amy from the future speaking, etc. As we have a very first public benchmark for the RTX at a 1380 graphics card. And this is thanks to a rogue game on Twitter. And it is a user benchmark results. And we're going to go through the results in a little bit here, but I'm not going to focus too much on them because to be that the results, as you can see as I'm scrolling down, they're a little low, I guess is, is what I'm trying to say. But I don't think we should read too much into this, to be honest. There is literally an infinite amount of reasons that it could be the case. You know, it literally could be early drivers, any number of issues, perhaps. This is an earliest uh, version of the card or anything. It literally laundry list of reasons why the score is low as it is. What I really want to focus on here is the specifications that we do see revealed to us thanks to this particular benchmark. So we can see. 2100 megahertz for the core clock, 4750 megahertz for the memory clock, 10 gigabytes of VRAM, so you can see the MISO ID of 10 to 06. So let's talk about those specifications a little bit, shall we? So the clock's frequency seems to be about what you would expect it, uh, for this particular card, and it also confirms that the card does indeed have. Of RAM and it also confirms that it runs at 1980 
when it was actually tested. For all we know, we're going to be seeing a higher clock speed for the final variant, but while we should always take it with the usual expected pinch of salt TM, this does confirm for us several details that we've seen in previous leaks about the RTX 3080. But obviously, NVIDIA's upcoming event in September is only a couple of weeks away, so we don't have to wait all that long to see how true the specs and of course the performance results end up being. I think after the recent leaks we had about the RTX 3090, all eyes are going to be on NVIDIA. Obviously, we all would have been watching keenly to see what they had to say anyway, but I think we're doubly curious now to see exactly what the price is going to be, the final specifications, and obviously the all critical response from AMD. Given what we've recently learned about the RTX 1390, there's definitely some concern for what RDNA 2 is going to be competing against, but obviously we don't even have the official reveal for RDNA 2. So let's just say that I think this next reveal from NVIDIA is going to be really, really interesting and is definitely going to give us a decent picture of the sort of market response to both series of graphics cards from NVIDIA and AMD that we will see. I think we are definitely going to see expensive cards from NVIDIA, you know, with the specs that we've seen, they're not going to cost 5p, you're not going to be able to get them in a bag pretty sweet, you know, and they still have change from the fiber, that's obviously not going to happen. But I do hope that NVIDIA have learned from the backlash after touring, as, as obviously good as those cards were, they were very expensive at launch, and that was kind of sort of addressed with Super, but I do think they need to keep that in mind uh, this time around, but obviously whether or not they can, or have decided to do that, I don't know, I don't like it in video last time I checked. Anyway, with all that said, however, let's move on to our final topic for today, which is a very interesting report from DFC Intelligence. So basically what we saw was the latest report from the company, they are an industry market research firm, if you're unfamiliar with them, and they released their latest global video game and segmentation report this Friday, and it shows some pretty interesting facts, of course you can find the full report are linked in the description below this video. Now the most interesting fact from this is that gaming now can... So... Guys, this is Sean and welcome to another episode of the Ehung Podcast. And in this episode of Asking Sean, we will be addressing a question from Fui Jin Bong. Hi Sean, first of all, congratulations on the 10k subscription. Thank you very much. I have a few questions on property investment and would like to ask for your opinion and advice. I am a Malaysian in the mid-30s working in Singapore. I have bought a house in my hometown coaching six years back and going to finish alone. And I am thinking of purchasing my second property in KL for rental and might consider for my own stay when I retire. Question. I understand that. Good to be back in Los Angeles now that I've got my full setup here with my desktop and everything the way I like it I can actually put out videos a bit more frequently than I did during the holidays I hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving by the way I know not all countries celebrated but for those who did I hope it was good I hope you spend time with family and friends and stuff your stomach and all that today I want to talk about the developer of a game you might be aware of it's called Ancestors the Humankind Odyssey, and it is an Epic Store exclusive for now, and it is also developed by Patrice Desolet, I believe that's how it's pronounced, who is the former Assassin's Creed director, essentially. He's sort of known for creating the Assassin's Creed series. 
So there were a lot of expectations from him, given his past history, that he was pursuing this new venture called Ancestors the Humankind Odyssey, which is published by the Private Division label from Take Two. The game launched not that long ago, and it didn't garner the best of reviews. It got mixed reviews. Some people liked it, some people not so much. So if you go to the Metacritic right now, you'll see that the meta score is currently at a 64 from 70 critics, and the user score is at 5.7 from 181 user reviews. A lot of people agree on the same thing. Ancestors The Humankind Odyssey is an ambitious game with some really cool ideas and some really cool survival elements that just outstays its welcome and doesn't have the depth of gameplay to keep players engaged for the amount of time that this game asks you to stay hooked. It just, the game isn't deep enough and the systems aren't fleshed out enough and certain elements are too clunky for it to be considered a great game despite some really neat ideas. From all the reviews I've read, that's sort of the general sentiment. I haven't played the game, so I'm not gonna judge it. That's just sort of what's out there based on all the user and critic reviews I've seen. But Patrick Desolet believes that there's foul play involved, which I think it's just him being a, just a bit of a sore loser instead of trying to take the criticism and taking that in stride and trying to improve for his next venture. So this is a story that was conveyed by news outlet Eurogamer, but the original article who first reported on this was Games Industry, where they transcribed what Panache Digital co-founder Patrice Desolet, who went indie, said during Reboot Develop Red, which is this event where the former creative director of Assassin's Creed talked about the reception surrounding Ancestors and Humankind Odyssey. And here is one of the first quotes that is highlighted in this article. I'm used to having bigger numbers than that, so it's the elephant in the room, he said, referring to the first three Assassin's Creed games, all of which had Metacritic averages between 80 and 90. But people expected my studio of 35 people to ship a game that is really close to Assassin's Creed, and it's just not possible. We made some harsh decisions in order to ship the game, and we wanted it to be different. I don't get the sense that that's necessarily true. I'm sure some people, when they heard the name Patrice Desolet, they thought, oh, he should make something along the lines of Assassin's Creed. But I think people are open to the idea of developers trying something new. And with Desolet, I think people understood that this development studio, Panache Digital, was a small studio, that it was kind of an indie studio of sorts, where they were making indie slash double A at best sort of games. I think that mentality was there, and I really don't think people expected a AAA high-budget Assassin's Creed level of a game from this studio, so I think that by itself is already something that I disagree with. People knew the position that Desolet was in, and they just wanted a cool game that functioned properly and that had some cool elements that were fleshed out, but Human Odyssey unfortunately fell short in certain areas, and that really is all there is to it. Then he continued, we know for a fact that some reviewers actually didn't play the game. So this is what's drawing a lot of backlash that he is accusing a lot of these reviewers not playing the game and that's why they gave it a bad score. He's basically saying there's no way that my game can be seen as being a bad game and that if you gave it a bad score then you just didn't play it or you just didn't get it and you are just not being legitimate with your criticism. And that kind of mentality is dangerous for a developer because it doesn't allow them to grow. It's just very cocky, it's very self-centered, there's a lack of introspection there. Maybe your game just fell short in certain areas and maybe for, you know, if there's a sequel or a next entry in that series, you could strive to improve, you could take the criticism to heart and just try to make a better game. It's okay to get a lower score with this ambitious new venture that you're doing, you tried something different, and that's something that can be appreciated, but you can't just look at the Metacritic score and say, this is bullshit, I'm just a great game developer, and this is just people not understanding my vision, or this is just people being unfair about their ratings. And it'd be one thing if there was a huge discrepancy between what the feedback is surrounding this game, but while there are a lot of good critical reviews where the game got a high score, there are plenty of low scores or just sort of average scores that highlighted the exact same issues with the game. 
that its systems just aren't fully fleshed out, that it's just too long, too repetitive, that it gets boring after a while, that it doesn't have the kind of depth that it needs to, and that it's just clunky in certain areas. That is something that's highlighted across the board throughout many reviews, though for some, the game concept and what it went for was compelling enough that it warranted a high score, so reviews are definitely mixed for this one, but even a lot of the user reviews highlight the exact same issues, that the game strives for something really interesting, but doesn't ultimately fully achieve that. And then Desolate continued it as part of our industry. They have to review games, and they have 15 of them to review in one week, and sometimes they don't have time. And since Ancestors is so different, some of them went, ugh, I don't have time for this. So again, it's just this widespread accusation saying that most reviewers just didn't finish the game or didn't play it. Now here's the thing, a lot of the major outlets have a big staff and so different people helm different games. SLA then cites one particular incident. He says, quote, and we know for a fact that some just invented some elements in the game, like there's no fire and you cannot ride any horses, even though one reviewer said, oh, it wasn't that great when you ride a horse. Yes, my people are pissed, by the way. He's saying, I saw one review that made up crap, and so all reviews must be corrupt. It should be noted that Trees doesn't exactly highlight which specific outlet said something about horse riding and fire and elements that didn't really exist in the game, but most reviews out there, if not all the ones that I've seen, never really mentioned anything about horse riding. The fact of the matter is that most reviews out there did, in fact, finish the game and didn't make up crap. So maybe this specific instance is out there, but that doesn't really necessarily mean that suddenly all reviews out there are in this mass conspiracy to give the game a bad score or that all reviewers didn't play the game and that their feedback is just completely unfair and unwarranted. So you've got Eurogamer right here saying, in the Eurogamer review, Kristen Donlan, who didn't mention horses, incidentally, said Ancestor is ambitious and clunky and not much fun, and it's often quietly thought-provoking too. And then here's what VG247 had to say about the matter. Quote, VG247 reviewed Ancestors, the Humankind Odyssey, back in August. It isn't very good, but we didn't make up anything about riding horses, and if you look at a lot of the reviews out there, you'll see that they don't make up anything about horses. And I'll highlight again that the feedback surrounding Ancestors, the Humankind Odyssey, its flaws, are universal. I've seen the same thing said over and over again across most reviews, both from critics and users alike. So instead of worrying about the score, just worry about that feedback and then just make a better game. You just cannot have this mentality of, well, I made all these great games in the past, therefore all my games from here on out will be great, and if anyone says otherwise, then they're just being dishonest. And then in this next quote, Desolate shares the sentiment that, quote, some didn't understand it before they gave up trying. It needs an hour, he said, before adding, maybe two. Well, at the very least, these reviewers did play the first couple hours of the game, and again, from what I've seen, a lot of them did in fact finish the game before relaying their thoughts. And the funny thing is that a lot of criticism isn't even 